Turn our Bibles to the book of Joshua, chapter 1. Thankful for the opportunity to uh, preach here tonight. I never take it lightly. So, uh, very grateful for the opportunity. Excited for the future. And we're going to be in uh, chapter 1. Let's switch here. And we're. That sounds better. All right. Here we go. Verse number one. The word of God says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give unto them, even to the children of Israel. Every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given it to you. As I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and into the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for the house of God that we can come and glean from you and what you would have uh, for us tonight. I pray that you would give me the words tonight. Help us uh, to learn something today to apply to our lives, Lord. For these things in your name, amen. So today it's going to be a little more, more practical. Um, a little less exhaustive, but in context of this passage, it's it's very interesting because this is one of the more grim openings to a chapter in the Bible. Because Joshua opens with, Moses is dead, and that's how it opens. And this is really monumental for the people of Israel at this time because Moses has been their guy. For the past 40 plus years, Moses has been their leader, leading them across uh, the Red Sea, into the wilderness, uh, communicating with God, giving them the Ten Commandments. And he has been their leader, but now he's gone. And God has now decided to raise up a leader, someone to replace Moses, to help this country who needs guidance from God and leadership, human leadership. And it, what's important in this passage, because Israel struggled with obtaining that promise that they were supposed to go into the land and take it, what God had promised them. And they were fearful. And with good reason so. There were giants in the land. There were great kingdoms. I mean, I'm sure they saw Jericho with the great walls. There was, this was an intimidating enemy that was there. But they were fearful. And now Joshua coming in, he was one of the good spies that realized that they could take it. Yet Joshua still has this spirit of something's holding him back. Because we can tell in this passage that God is repeating something. He's repeating, be of good courage, be courageous, and then you'll have success. But this success comes with a condition. God doesn't say you'll just have success. But in verse 7, 8, and 9, he talks about the conditions of that success. And looking at this chapter, we have to turn, we see how you define success is far different than how God defines success. It's very much different. You know, um, the U.S., uh, the FAA, the Federal uh, Aviation Administration, they actually have this very interesting, unique way of testing the uh, legitimacy of their airplane windshields, of testing the strength of those. And what they did was they developed this machine, basically this cannon that would fire a dead chicken into the windshield. And they would fire at the same rate of speed that the airplane was going. Um, and therefore, if the wind could withstand the impact from that chicken, it would be, it would be flight worthy. 
And so they had been running this, and uh, this British aerospace engineer company, got, uh, they got a load of this. And they were testing these uh, uh, modern uh, locomotives, that, these high-speed locomotives, and they wanted to run a similar test uh, for their windshields. And so they get in contact with the FAA, and they say, hey, uh, can we get this machine? Can we get the blueprints or whatever, the manual? And so the FAA sent these over to this British aerospace engineering company, and they breezed through the manual, and they got this cannon ready, got the dead chicken there, and they fired this, fired this chicken, and it went flying straight through the windshield, breaking, destroying everything. The internal panels in there destroyed everything. And they're scratching their heads, and they're thinking, Something, something's not right here. We, we must have messed up with something. So they contact the FAA back in the U.S., and they explain what happened, and so that the FAA did this uh, sort of analysis of what they did and what went wrong, and they had one word of recommendation. All they said was, make sure to thaw the chicken. And so what they missed was this one important thing. They forgot to do this one important thing. And in our lives, it works with success that way. We, we try to make up this uh, version of our own success, but we miss the one fact that we're supposed to put it in light of God. See, we can go through life managing to fabricate our own version of success. Uh, we do so by redefining what it actually is. We give it a materialistic and prideful twist. We say success is having an abundance of wealth, titles, friends, talent, discipline, attractiveness, and diplomas. But none of those things are inherently bad. But the problem is, is we go by this definition of success we have made ourselves and forget to actually, to actually pay attention to the user's manual in this case. And where does that leave us? And just as that chicken went straight through that windshield, you know, we have relied on this self-conjured idea of success to give us happiness. And it will fail every time. See, God doesn't measure success by how much money you have, how many friends you have, how nice your 401k plan is looking, how athletic you are, how good looking you are, how accomplished you are. God measures success by how well you apply the word of God to your life. So what is your measuring stick for success? Have you been using the wrong measure for your life? Has your battle to reach for the world's success exhausted you? See, in this passage, Joshua, he was given conditions. And in verse 8, we find this. But Joshua, he did not only need to read God's word, but he was to, he had to have it on his lips, on his mind, and he had to do it. And so tonight, we're going to observe three ingredients in God's blueprint for biblical success and how you can follow it in 2024. So the first item we see is to mingle with the word. This is found in verse 8, which says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. You know, if someone is sick, they, they need the proper medication, right? And just like if we want real success, we gotta have, we got to have the solution. And let me tell you, this is the solution. So, therefore, if success is the result of application from God's word, then we have to get in the word. We need to draw nigh to God's word. There's a phrase that says, nearness is likeness. And that's a lot, that's very much true in all aspects of life. When you associate with something, you're going to become more like it. The more we invest in time in the Word, the more we're going to mirror it. And so, firstly, we see in this mingling with the Word is that there is the discipline to draw near. And time in the Word, it's a discipline. It's a work. It's, it's not easy. It's what, what you make a priority in life, you'll give time to it. And so, how's that priority? You make time for that which you love. And so, we look at how much time we've given to the Bible this week. How much we've given to it today. The amount of time you invest in God's Word is a reflection of how much of a priority it is in your life. And so, this starts with changing how we view the Word, word of God. And... When we are, it's a discipline. Yes, discipline seems hard. You know, we, we don't really like the word, but we got to change our mind to get a better view of this. See, the Bible is God's love letter to you. God has written it for all of humanity, but he wants it for you. 
He's written it to you. Every time you read the Bible, God has something for you. Every time we get in, he wants to teach something specifically to you. It's not just to hear a story, not a fairy tale, which it's not, which some people treat it like. It's a word from God to you. And we have to make the Bible personal. So what, what, what does this passage mean to me? you got to ask yourself. When I'm reading, what, 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 what did God ha- why did God have me read about Cain and Abel today? What, what is God teaching me about Paul and Silas in the prison? What is God teaching me? What, what is, what is, why, do I, why did he have me read about all these things? Put yourself in the passage. For God so loved me that he gave his only begotten son. You've got to put yourself and apply it to you. Make it personal. You know, maybe, let's say, look at this. You, you come back to your home one day, and there's a letter taped to the front door, and you read it, and it's a letter from the previous owner of the house. And he says, listen here, I got good news for you. So I totally forgot, but I buried $10 million worth of gold on your property. And the deed's now in your name, so I guess it's yours. So I, I, don't, I buried it somewhere on this property, but if you can find it, it's yours. And so, I mean, if that were true, you would, you would go, you would spend all the money you could because your house is not worth $10 million, so you would be buying metal detectors, excavators, you would do whatever it takes to find this gold, to find this money, to find this treasure. You know, the Bible says, Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice in understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as hid treasures, then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. Charles Spurgeon said, no man who merely skims the Bible can profit from it. We must dig and mine until we obtain hidden treasure. If you're just breezing through the Bible, it's not going to affect you. You get out of it what you put into it. That's how it works. You can't apply the word of your, to, to the word, you can't apply the word of God to your life if you aren't getting input from it. So not only is uh, the, there's the discipline to draw near, but there are the benefits of drawing near. And this is the best part. See, spending time in God's word is the greatest addition you can ever have to your life. It is God's literal word for you, for each and every one of us. And this is exactly why we don't speak in tongues today, that God doesn't speak audibly today, that all these things will happen, because we have the completed word of God. It is done. It is completed. That's all we need. This is the revelation of God to us. That's all we need. And so, what does it provide for us? Well, we'll just go over a few things tonight. Guidance. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It provides wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that give it to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Give us understanding. The entrance of thy word giveth light, and it giveth understanding unto the simple. It gives truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It gives cleansing. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. It provides comfort. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. It provides protection from sin. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And I could go on and on. Hope, strength, identity, purpose, community, transformation and change. It gives eternal life. What God has given us, he's given us the message of eternal life in his word. God's word is available for our benefit. It is our compass to follow Christ. Christian, you ought to use it. See, the devil does not fear a Christian with a dusty Bible. We got to use it to influence the kingdom of God and influence this world, to punch holes in the darkness. And so let's also, let's just give some, some application. If you're in the habit of taking notes or whatever, I think these are great qualities that I've received. Five simple ways how we can apply this, what we've learned. You got to have time. And if you have it, two words, maybe quality and quiet. You got to have that time you spend with God. It's, you got to schedule a time and a place. What gets scheduled gets done. If, if you're doing it, you've got to have quiet and quality time. If you don't set a specific time, if you don't set it aside, it won't be a priority and it's not going to get done. 
it, it doesn't have to be a long time. It doesn't have to be an hour, an hour and a half. There's nothing wrong with that. I think that's good for you, but it doesn't have to be that long. We all have lives we have to live, but it, it can be any amount of time as long as it, it can impact you. Watchman Nee said, no Bible, no breakfast. I mean, that's how he did it. I'm not saying that's how you should do it. Everyone has different schedules. I'm working at 4 a.m. That's not how it works for me. Everyone's schedules are different. But not only is it time, quiet and quality, but then next you pray. And the two words for this, I would say, is remove and request. We remove sin and we request illumination from the Holy Spirit. That's asking the Holy Spirit to speak to us when we're in our time with God. We ask the Holy Spirit to reveal something in his word. We got to assess ourselves. Is there sin in my life? Before I start reading from the Bible, I got to, am I right with God? Is there something between me and God? Lay it out. Ask God to forgive you. Uh, when I was at MBT, Neighborhood Bible Time, they gave us these a uh, few questions to ask ourselves every day. They said, first, ask, am I conscious of any distractions in the shape of any competitor for the strength and allegiance of my soul? What does that mean? It, is there something stealing my allegiance to God? Is there something stealing that? Secondly, is there a decision I need to make? Is there any idolatry in my heart? Is there sin I need to confess? Those are pretty revealing questions about yourself. If you ask those, it's pretty clean cut between you and God if you can answer those questions right. So not only is it time, quiet, and quality, pray, remove, and request, but then you got to read. And for this, the two words would be search and surrender. So the goal is not to get done. The goal is for God to change your life during this time when you're reading his word. My dad always says, read till it burns. And that's basically saying you don't have to spend a certain amount of time. Just read until a truth gets to you, until, it, until a, a God has given a sermon. Look for God's sermon for you. You got to surrender something. Claim that promise, whatever it is. Talk to God about what God talked to you about. And that's that goes into this uh, fourth step, which is pray again. After you've, you've got that time, you've prayed, and you've spent that time with God reading, then pray. And this would be confess and consecrate. Take off and put on what God would have you to do. This is a time when you start having that addition. The first is kind of that subtraction, getting right with God. This is that addition. God, help me to apply what I learned. And putting, getting the run out and putting the right in. Talk to God about what he talked to you about, as we said. And then lastly would be right. And this is the most helpful for me in my time with God is right. And this would be remember and review. And for me, if I just have my devotions and I'm just reading the Bible and I don't write anything down, there's no way I'm going to remember what happened that morning. That's just how, that's just how it works for me. I, I don't have that great memory. So use a journal. Remember what you write, what you write, or something like that. So those are some practical aspects of just mingling with the Word, that time with God's Word, and and remembering what God's Word actually is to us. It's not just a book. This is the Word. The Word was made flesh. This is God as in giving us His Word. And then secondly is meditate on the Word. Not only do we mingle on the Word, but we meditate on the Word. And this has something I think has been forgotten a lot in Christianity because when we think meditate, we're thinking, oh, crisscross your legs and um, like that's that's a pagan meditate. Meditate, it's it's just a it, meditation is a constant awareness of God. This is the key to sustaining intimacy with God, keeping what you learn on your mind. Your takeaway from the morning should affect how you live your day, and it do, the takeaway from the morning does you no good if you're not living it out. If it's not helping you for today, what is Psalm chapter one? He says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But here's the kicker. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. This, this wise man is thinking about the word of God. He's not just taking it in and then, okay, put that on snooze. This is the rest of my day. This is my responsibilities. It's no. The Word of God is soaking into every part of your day, every part of your life. It's like, it's like a cow, you know. A cow's in that field, you know. A cow seems like a dumb animal, you know. It's just kind of there. But, you know, what's happening is when it's eating, it's eating this grass, and he's chewing it up, and he's, he's digesting it into his first stomach. 
But then that first stomach, it brings it back up. He regurgitates again to chew it even a little more. And then he digests it again into his second stomach. That's like meditation, you know. You, you have that morning time with God, and then, then you digest it a little bit, think about it, think about it throughout the day. Then you bring it back up later in the day, maybe when you're at work, maybe you're driving home, maybe you're sitting in the fast food drive through you're, you're thinking about it again. Bring it back to mind. So your morning devos, think, meditate on that lesson. Set reminders throughout your day, maybe on your phone. And meditation first requires time. And repetition is the key to lear learning. That's what teachers always stuff down my throat when, I'm at, when I was in high school or when I'm in college. Keep doing it. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Get it down. Repeat, repeat. So make time and ways for you to rethink about what you have learned. If you just kind of leave it up to like maybe, oh, I'll remember to remember. <laughs> like it's kinda, it kind of gets worse and worse. So practical ways for meditating, you can set reminders on your phone. This is what I do a lot. Go on your reminders app. You just, okay, uh, remind uh, what I read this morning. You can put that. You can set it different times of the day. Remind me at 1, 3, and 6 o'clock today. You can set it. Uh, remind me on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday or every day if you want to. If you, uh, if you like it better, you can carry a 3 by 5 card on you. And maybe write down that verse that you thought was really good for you in the morning. And maybe uh, an application you had and leave it in your pocket. And you know, when you're on your lunch break, you bring it back out again and remind yourself. Memorize verses. As we said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might sin against thee. Memorizing verses and hiding in your heart is the best way to meditate on it. Because it's instantly in your mind. Not only does meditation require time. But as well, it requires practice. In 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it says, pray without ceasing. And that's kind of a brain scratcher, right? Because, like, how am I supposed to do anything if all I'm doing is praying? But that's not the spirit of the verse. The spirit of the verse is saying, constantly be aware of God. Constantly think, think about God throughout your day. Don't just give him a segment of your life. Last time on New Year's, we talked about compartmentalized Christianity, where we just kind of put God in a separate part of our life, and this is our life? No, you have it flow together, merge together. Meditation needs to be a habit. As Pastor said a few weeks ago during Snow Church, he talked about it takes three times to make something a habit. So maybe in three days, if you can, if you can set those reminders, have your three-by-five card or whatever, and remind yourself for three days, oftentimes it'll, it'll pick up steam. That's how a lot, and that works for bad habits as well. And so there's kind of four key practices that I've learned at college talking about meditation. There's knowledge, understanding, personalize, and practice. Knowledge is that learning part. You know, don't skin. Give the Bible your undivided attention when you're, when you're having your devotions, whatever time of day it is. Understanding is that study. Don't just read it. Let it, and let it penetrate your thinking. Ask questions. This doesn't quite make sense. Maybe I should... Uh, look into this more in another study help, or I can ask pastor, or I can talk to someone about this. God will guide you to those answers in understanding. And personalize. Own it. Make it yours. Don't just leave it, don't just leave it in, your, in, in your office or in your room. you got to keep it with you at all times. Internalize it. And practicing is just doing it. Flat out doing it. Being doers of the word. And then lastly, not only we've talked about... Um, we talked about mingling with the word and meditating on the word, but we got to mirror the word. This is what being a doer of the word is kind of like, mirroring the word. And this is found in verse 8, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. See, Joshua, he was given these three commands. He's got he's to have it be on his lips in verse number 8. It shall not depart out of thy mouth. But you got to meditate day and night and then observe it. These three are the three conditions to their success. If you want to have a successful year, that's going to be you applying God's word to your life the most you can. And it comes to these three ways. And internalizing the word of God is evidenced by mirroring it. You look at someone, you say, that's a godly person. They didn't just get like that by chance. It's because they studied, they meditated, and they Took that meditation, thinking about it all the time, leads you to doing it all the time. Uh, as we've said, live what you learn. Anyone can put effort to study the word, but it takes a devoted disciple to actually live it. James 1.22, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Pastor Paul Chappell said, 
It is good to mark your Bible, but it is essential for the Bible to mark you. Having that imprint on your life through the day from God's Word. And in mirroring the Word, what are some helps we can have? First, you got to be specific. You know, put a plan in place to follow God's leading that He's given you for the day. Whether it was uh, you had devotions last night, carry that over today. If that's how, you're, that how your habit is. You struggle with gossip? Well, then you got to set a plan to attack that. How do you attack something like gossip? Well, for example, you know, think, you know what, I'm going to say three good things about someone today or say three good things about three different people today. That's a tangible, specific goal. Put it to practice. Remind yourself. We said those ways of reminding these things. That's a tangible way to do it. Another example, maybe you struggle with pr your prayer life. You're just, you're, you're not that aware of God. You're not thinking about God a lot, you know. Then I would just say, you know, I would say, I would say, I will set reminders on my phone to pray three specific times during a day. That's a way you can do it. Or I will set a 15-minute timer during my time with God. And that specific time, I'm, all I'm going to do is pray. And that's a, a way you can mirror the word. That's you got to make it specific. You can't just, you got to put it on words. you got to put it in some way that will force you to do it. Maybe you struggle with anger. You say, no, I'm going to memorize three verses that will help me to react correctly, to deal with my anger. And then I'm going to quote them whenever I get tempted to lash out. That's a specific way to do this, to apply the word to your life, to live it out. Not only do you have to be specific, but as well you can be assessing. you got to review how you're doing. you got to be doers of the word. Those who are doers of the word must continue in well-doing. You know, it's, it's kind of like uh, when I was growing up, you know, we went, to, we went to camp, right? And it's a common stereotype with camp. You know, you make a lot. It's just a really spiritual place. All the world, the world's music, all. You're kind of just there in God's presence with God's people. And you make all these awesome decisions, but a week or two later, you kind of forget about them. You kind of just don't do them. And that's what happens when we don't internalize these things. So we got, the way we can continue to do these things is we got to assess ourselves. We say, oh, how did I do this week? So review how you're doing. John 8, 31 says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on, believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Just as a disciple has to continue in being a disciple, that it's like, let's imagine, am I a church goer if I go to church once every three months? No, you're not. So you got to continue to do what's good. If you're on the right track, keep it up. Remind yourself of your commitments. God promises success when we apply his word, then we must continually assess if we actually are applying it. And God's word lived out is guaranteed success, but not without problems. See, but is by success empowered by God's presence and God's promises. See, God's presence helps motivate us to be faithful in applying his word. His presence is a promise. If we look back in verse number 8 of our text, it says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, which we've been talking about, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written there. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. This is, in fact, actually the only time in the whole Bible where it mentions the word success. Uh, have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. And this phrase right here, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. That's a promise. We even look back in verse number five. It says, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. We got to stand on God's promises. We got to claim them, personalize them. Don't be a spectator, but take advantages of those promises that God has given us. You know, in Christianity, some people... Some people are standing on the promises while other people are standing on the premises. You know, they're just kind of spectators. They're not really looking, they're not partaking of what God has for us. With the Bible, the life that the Bible gives us and just the encouragement it gives us by having that relationship with God. It's just invigorating. Don't just mingle and meditate on the word, but both, put both to practice and mirror the word. And even just a few weeks ago, I think, Pastor gave an excellent message when we were kind of on that snow day. He gave that message about a 40-day test drive, a 40-day test drive with Jesus. Testing, put, putting to practice, just give it a test drive. And I think, how many of us have actually went on that test drive? 
Have we given it a chance? See, the goal is not to follow a checklist. The Bible isn't a burden, but it's rather a gateway to a relationship with God, with Jesus Christ. Um, I think of, uh, there's a uh, professor that used to teach at West Coast. His name is Dr. Jim Shetler. He now kind of travels around uh, just uh, doing a little bit of revival work and helping out uh, churches and uh, doing conferences and stuff like that. But he gave this illustration. He, he said he went, went on this trip to Scotland. And while he was on his, way, on his way to Scotland, he was reading this book called um, The Sheepdog. And basically, this book is comparing how a sheepdog, their life, comparing to that of a pastor and how he would uh, shepherd the church, uh, be an under-shepherd uh, with God and shepherding the church and being a leader. And when he was in Scotland, he was uh, driving through, and this was a very uh, big pasture area with a lot of sheep exactly what he was kind of reading about. And so he was in the passenger seat of this car, and he, he's driving, you know, and he sees all these sheep, and he starts noting there's some shepherds around. He, and he's thinking about this book. i got to ask some questions. Is this, stuff, is this stuff actually real? So he tells the driver, pull over, pull over right now. So he gets out of the car, and he sees this lady here in the, in the pasture, and he goes, shepherd, shepherdess, or however you will call it. He yells at this lady and says, hey, i got some questions. And so this, this Scottish shepherd lady comes by and uh, says, uh, you know, has a Scottish accent or whatever. She says, hey, how you doing? And Dr. Shelley, he said, yeah, I'm a pastor from America. And I've been reading this book about how a sheepdog is similar to a pastor leading a church and uh, being an under-shepherd to, to Christ, Jesus. And she's like, oh, yeah, sure, you have any questions? And he's like, yeah. I, and so he started asking her questions because every chapter in that book was a kind of an analogy to how a pastor, what they should do, comparing it to a sheepdog and the sheepdog's job. And they were going one by one, and she's like, yeah, yep, yep. Every single one was true, the sheepdog's role. And so he had finished asking the questions, and he was uh, basically finished with this conversation. So he was leaving to his car, and then the, the shepherdess lady, she said, hey, 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 wait. Are you not going to ask about the reward of the sheepdog? And so he says, the reward of the sheepdog? What are, you, what are you talking about? And she's like, yeah, yeah, the reward of the sheepdog. And so Dr. Shetler, he goes, well, well, what's the reward of the sheepdog? And so the shepherdess lady, she says, yeah. So the sheepdog is working with the shepherd the whole day, you know, doing hard work, gathering on these, these sheep, feeding the sheep, taking care of the sheep, protecting the sheep, making sure the sheep look good, all day working and laboring over these sheep. And the sheepdog... The reward of the sheepdog is that the sheepdog gets to go back in the house with the shepherd. And at night, the sheepdog gets to lay with the shepherd, to, have, to be cared for by the shepherd, to be loved by the shepherd, to spend time with the shepherd. Church, that's the reward of us. We get to spend time with God, the God of the universe. And he wants to talk to us. And that's through his word. And when we ignore his word, that relationship is partly strained. That's the reward of the sheepdog, but it is the reward of the Christian. You are as close to God as you want to be. That's how it works. That's what matters, not the success of the world. It's success in God's eyes that matter. So we need to prioritize spiritual success, prioritize God's word, this year in 2024. Let's pray.